to present that to you. Um, and I, your book actually does a fantastic job at it. So let me first um, cover some things as recall. And everything's hidden in this one theorem. They call it interior extremum theorem. So we actually, it's like a crescendo coming out. Like mean value theorem is one of the most important theorems. It's, uh, you don't think of it when you, again, in calculus, you're just going through the process, trying to get those AP credits or whatever. How many of you got AP cards in calculus? I took AP cards. Everybody, Bridget? <laughs> okay, so um, that theorem, when you took if you took it, they just probably made you find the C. Like you were given the endpoints and you had got given a function and you had to find the C. So it did like I remember taking it and not thinking about how important this was. And then later on, mean value theorem kept coming up. And then I had a course, I think I told you about this, with Michael Loss. He's one of the best PDE people in the world, math, physics. Wrote a book on analysis called Lehman Loss. I have an extra copy of that, actually, um, that he gave me, uh, Michael Loss gave me. But I decided, uh, he told us that he would give us all Bs. In um, graduate school, a B is a bad thing. You don't want a B. He said, you can get an A. Sign up for an oral exam with me and get an A but I reserve the right to give you a C if you come to that oral exam. So most people in the class just decided I'm not gonna sign up for an oral exam with this guy. And I thought I'm gonna do it. So I went in there and I was talking about something called maximum principles, which I showed you guys in class the other day. The maximum principle says that if you have some kind of um, surface from a PDE and you know what happens on the boundary, if there's certain cases where you know the maximum occurs on the boundary. And if the maximum occurs on the boundary, then you can say something about the solutions to the PDE. So like we use this in PDEs all the time. So that's what I decided to cover. I went to the oral exam, I went down and he started asking me questions. And it turns out that these maximum principles are really derived from calculus mean value theorem. And the very last question he asked me, which I answered, I don't know was, can you prove the mean value theorem? You never forget something like this. I, I was nearly, to the point I was going to wet myself. <laughs> and then I, you know, I'm going to get my first C in graduate school. Um, and it was going to be coming from him because I dared to come in and ask for an all exam. He did not give me a C, but I was sure sweating because I could not prove the mean value theorem. So I'm here today to prove the mean value theorem to you. Um, much more, much more relaxed. Had two cups of coffee, had a slice of bread with peanut butter. I'm ready to prove the mean value. Theorem. So just to recall, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful theorem when you see what the applications are like. It's like, um, you're just, it's one of those things where you see something, you're like, eh, whatever, it's obvious. And then later on, it just keeps haunting you. Like, mean value, mean value, it's a really important theorem. So um, just to recall, um, back at some point, um, and I think Dr. Moina, Moina must have covered this, um, I call these local maxes, but in some books they call it relative. Um, I call it local because it makes more sense to me in application. We talk about local maxes or this is the formal definition. You need this formal definition. Today I'm going to have you do some stuff on the boards. And this will be boards because I'm not collecting something. I want to see you guys actually use these definitions. Local max means that there's a neighborhood where f of x is smaller than this f of c in this neighborhood. Local min is the other way around. The inequality goes around. For all x belonging to this neighborhood. And I'm not going to write this on the board. You're just going to copy it. When we talk about local extrema, we mean either a local max or a min. If you saw the keynote speaker, um, I thought his uh, at the um, project day. Did you were you there for that? He he talked about the rigor. I I liked him a lot. Um, I thought it was really cool that his undergraduate degree was in pure mathematics, and he talked about that importance of having those definitions. 
And I can't tell you how important those are. Like that keeps coming up. Um, we're, we're, I'm working in a precision nutrition and they have, um, there's no formal definition of precision nutrition. And everybody's talking about loose definitions. Like, you can't be loosey-goosey about it if you want me to model it. I need to know what goes in the model and I need to know what comes out of the model. So I need a rigorous definition. So that's some, some way of thinking that comes from math, uh, pure mathematics. Um, so when we talk about extrema, we're talking about local maxes and mins. And we talk about Local maxes and mints, we're using this definition. That's what's important, and that's what distinguishes math from other species. Okay, so here, everything's baked into this theorem. It's called, he calls it this, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard this called anything outside of his book, but he calls it the interior extremum theorem. And what it says is, um, if, I have a C in the interior of an, of an interval. Can I just call them local? Because that's kind of what they are, right? Local extrema. If the derivative exists, then the derivative is zero at that point. So all of you have plebes running around taking 104. They're using this. They sometimes don't even know when, why they're doing it. They just get a problem. They start taking the derivative of 70. Close to zero. We talked about this in differential equations today. Is it considered hazing to make them watch this video? Would it be? Which one do you want to do? It's the one I'm recording. Oh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Only, only if they then need uh, C four decided they were going to push up some morning formation. Yeah, you know. Okay. So you could have a morning formation. They watch this video. Yeah. And it's, it's a win-win. It's torture, and they might learn something. Just like. But it's lo it's lovely. You're doing 104 in here. Okay, so I'm going to prove this, and then I'm going to give you a board, some board work along this line. So I will prove for local maxes, and I have you prove it for local mints. Does that consider hazing? This point. It's a little late in the semester to ask about. So good habits. When you have something to prove, put down your know, put down your show, be very clear of what you have to do. Those of you who try to get away with it in your notebooks, not doing that, it just came right back at you. I'm do that. I'm back, I'm not traveling anymore. I can ask you to do this. Let's see you be in this interior of the interval. It just means that it's an interval, so you're not including the endpoints. Then what I know is f of x is less or equal to f of c for all x belonging to this neighborhood. Intersect i. That neighborhood exists. That's my know. What do I have to show? Is zero. That's what I have to show. So I'm just going to take this one step back. If it exists, what does that tell me? More 104. 
the part of 104 they hate. Some of them hate everything. So the majority of them hate this part. They call it taking the derivative the long way. <laughs> Not here. Other colleges, I always have someone say, my high school teacher Fred showed me an easier way. No one, I don't know what it says back here. One of the pluses of West Point. All right, so I put that down because we're going to have to work with that. Um, and that's what that, that means to have to have a derivative exist. All right, so um, section four. There's an obscure theorem, and I didn't cover it, so I'm thinking Dr. Moon covered it, but she might not have covered it because it's kind of like buried. There's a last theorem in that section, 4.2. But what it said was very interesting. And I'm going to use G's. I, I, my notes, I have F's, but I'm going to use a G so that it's not that F up there. So in my note, I also have this theorem. It's 4.2.9. doesn't have a name. Um, and what it said is that um, if I have a subset of the reals, and I have this g going from a to the reals of the function, c is a cluster point, of a, if the limit as x approaches c of g of x is bigger than zero, then there exists a v, and um, again, this is a v delta prime. It's not the same v that's talked about there, so I don't want to use the notation. I sometimes do, and last night I did. So v delta. So for all x belonging to this neighborhood, such that this thing is bigger than zero, um, oh, I rewrote that. All right, let me see if this makes sense. I was I was watching the Ranger game as I was prepping class, so, and if you watch that game, it's hard to concentrate on two things. But let that be a set, I've got a function, and um, there's a C where I know it's a cluster point, and so it's something inside an interval if you have an interval. If I know that the limit as x approaches C of a function is bigger than zero, then there's a neighborhood around it, such that for all x inside this neighborhood that's inside your set as well, um, we are going to have this. So if you know the limit is positive, there's a little neighborhood around it where the function is positive. Otherwise, the limit could be positive. That's what it says. It says something obvious. Proof is in Bartle. It's not hard to actually understand. It's at the end of the section on cluster points and um, neighborhoods. So it's uh, more the topological stuff that you guys did. So it's like buried in there. So what, how am I going to use this? Well, I'm going to use this by saying, assume on the contrary, that f prime of x is not zero, but it's bigger than zero. I'm going to show that can't happen. So remember, my show is to show f prime of x is f prime of c is bigger than zero. So assume, I'm sorry, that's c. I'm going to assume on the contrary that's true.
and I let g of x be this thing. Well, according to that obscure theorem, 4.2.9, Assume the contrary that f prime t is greater than zero, and then we're going to assume the contrary that's less than zero. And from that, we're going to bracket it to be. Right. Well, you're going to do the less than zero. Right. right. So g of x, I'm going to define it to be this function. I know that as x approaches c, because I assumed on the contrary that this thing, as x approaches c, is going to be bigger than zero. By, so by, the obscure theorem, there exists a neighborhood such that g of x is strictly greater than zero. Right? That's what that theorem says. I called it obscure theorem because it didn't have a name. And it was just kind of buried there. There's a whole bunch of things. Like if you look at chapter four, there's lots and lots of theorems. Why would this be special over any other theorem? So it's not pulled out in any way of being. So it's an obscure theorem. That's 4.2. 4.2. Right. Okay, so what is that? Is but if I take an x to the right of c, um, I don't think that he has this in here, but you have a, a neighborhood around c. You intersect it with the neighborhood around the other neighborhood that I know things are supposed to happen in my given. Um, then f of x minus f of c is equal to x minus c times f of x minus f of c divided by x minus c. I know that this is positive on that interval. I know this is positive because x is bigger than c, so this guy's positive. Delta prime. This delta prime came from theorem 4.2.9. This delta comes from the no that I, I think, yeah, the no that I have. No, this is still my no from this one, but on the, on the other no that I have, I have um, a v delta of c, right? If c is in the interior and I have this extremum point, it's the local min property comes from local from I know local max. Sorry. That way you should put in the picture. It's just a little little easy part. Just getting one back. That's where those come from. That's why I have two. Um, only quibble that I have about Barbo is that he didn't do that, but. Um, if this is a neighborhood around C and that's a neighborhood around C, then their intersection is not empty because they have to include C and a little bit around it. And so, and then intersect with side. So that's not going to be an empty intersection at the end of the day. Um, so then I got that's bigger than zero. That's true. Well, then f of x is bigger than f of c. And then I have my contradiction. Can you see what the contradiction is? Uh, Thanks. 
do be able to see it. See if it's a relative maximum. So that I can include that F prime C cannot be bigger than zero. So I want you to do the other case. Um, because we're not getting homework on this, um, I want to see that you understood what was going on in this um, proof so far. So do the uh, there's two cases, right? Now assume on the contrary that it's less than zero. Try it out. I think there might be a way to do this in a slick way. But I don't want to attempt it on the board right now. Let me just... Yeah. 